Welcome back. What we're going to talk about in this chapter of the, the, the course is about going concurrent in Erlang, which of course is one of its, its major selling points. We've got two parts to the, um, to the chapter. What I'm going to talk about first of all is how you create processes and then talk about how those processes communicate by sending messages. So that's the main part of the, of the, the course. So processes in Erlang are very lightweight. You can run 20, 30,000 processes in a virtual machine quite happily. So very different from running threads in a, in a, a traditional language. And the other thing to be aware of is that processes are, don't share memory. So each process has its own memory, separately garbage collected. The only way that processes can interact with each other is by sending messages. So what we need to find out, first of all, is how you create a process. Um, and that is done by the spawn BIF. And what spawn does is um, it's passed an argument, which is a module name, function name, and list of arguments, just like apply. Um, and what happens is that creates a new process, which runs that function from that module with those arguments as its code. Processes are identified by process identifiers, and these are called PIDs in Erlang. Um, so you'll see variables called PID1 and so on all the way through this, this part of the course. What we'll do in, when talking about concurrency is to identify processes by their PID. So instead of saying process with PID1, we'll just say PID1. Instead of saying process with PID2, we'll say PID2. So we'll talk about PIDs sending messages and so on. It's just the, the simpler way of doing it. So what's the effect of a spawn? If you look in the diagram, before the spawn, we have a single process running. In that process, we've called spawn. After that, we have a second process which runs the code that is the module mod and function func with the arguments supplied in that argument list. The other thing to be aware of is that the return value of that spawn is the PID for the new process. So the only knowledge about that process is contained within process PI with PID1. That has the knowledge of how to get the handle how to interact with process with PID2. One final thing to note um, that the, the uh, function must be exported from the module in order for it to be spawned in that way. And as I said midway through this discussion, our convention all the way through this and all the, all the way through the rest of the course is that we'll identify processes by their PIDs. So we'll talk about process P with PID1 or just PID1. Okay, so what we have now is we have two processes running. What's running in, in PID2 is um, this function func. What's running in PID1 is whatever followed that, um, that spawn command. Okay, so now we have two processes running. What happens um, if the function, if we call a, a spawn, where um, for whatever reason, for example, uh, suppose the function isn't exported from the module, suppose it isn't defined in the module, um, what happens to that spawn call? Well, in fact, that, that the, B, the BIF spawn never will fail. The spawn will always succeed, but what happens is that the process creation may terminate abnormally. Um, so if the process, if the function wasn't exported or didn't exist, what will happen is that the, um, the process is created and then immediately terminates abnormally. Otherwise, when does a process terminate? Well, we've, what we've asked it to do is execute the, the function func in the module mod and what will happen is that, that there's a certain amount of code in that, in that function definition. And when we get to the end of that code, that process will terminate normally. This is nothing else to execute. So we get normal termination when the, the process runs its course. But we get abnormal termination immediately 
when we get a runtime error, um, and we, we're getting a runtime error, for instance, if the module uh, doesn't exist, if the function does it, doesn't exist in the module, or that function isn't exported from the module. So now we know how to create a process using Spawn, and we've found out what happens if, if, um, if the process fails. Let's see what we can do about passing a message between one process and another. The construct we use is a, the exclamation mark or pling operator. What you put on the left is the destination of the message. And what you put on the right is any valid Erlang value. Um, typically, these things are tuples, but they don't have to be tuples. In fact, we'll see a, an example later on where you send a function as a message. So any valid Erlang value can be sent as a message from one process to another. M message sending never fails. So we know that in, in the PID, in the process that aims to send, wants to send a message, that operation always succeeds. But if a, if a process doesn't exist, if the PID we're using is not an active process, the message is simply thrown away. But if the pre PID does exist, if the process is running, the message is put into a mailbox for that process. So what we have here is what's called asynchronous message passing. We don't have to wait for the message to be received and handled by the recipient in order to continue in the sending process. So PID1 sends the message to PID2 in this example and then does whatever is next in the code. In the example you see on the slide, one other thing to be, to be aware of is we've sent here a message which... Um, is a tuple with two items in it. The second is the atom foo, but the first is a call to the biff self, which takes no arguments, and what that returns is the PID of the process in which it's executed. So in, this, in the example here, what that will evaluate to is to PID1, whatever is the process ID of the process that's sending the message. And this is a typical Erlang construction, because what we're doing here is we're sending a message to process 2, which contains our PID. And what that allows us to do, it allows PID 2 to get information about us, and so send us a message back. And that's, we see that all through Erlang code, which, which does message passing. We have explicitly, if we're using process IDs to identify processes, we have explicitly to pass those around so that one process gets knowledge of another's process's PID. OK, so just to, to summarise what I've been saying here, PID2 pling sends a message to PID2. The message here is going to be PID1 paired up with foo, and it will get stored in the process mailbox. So PID2 has a collection of a number of messages, potentially, waiting to be processed. What we need to think about after we've talked about how messages are sent is what we do when messages are received. Now we see the, the, the message being sent. And here we see what's going to happen at the other end. We've got a receive construct which looks very like a case construct. It looks very like an if then else, it looks very like pattern matching. What do we have? We have the, the keywords receive and end, which delimit the construction. We have a number of clauses, and each clause has a head and a body. The head of the clause is a pattern. The body of the clause is a sequence of, of expressions. Clauses are separated by semicolon, and of course, there's no separator at the end of the last clause, because it's a separator rather than a terminator. And what each pattern represents is the, the shape of the message that we're expecting to receive. Uh, so in the example here, we're seeing two patterns. 
we're expecting to receive messages which are pairs and we're signaling them, um, we, we, we're switching on the value of the first field, which is an atom here. And again, that's a typical, we've seen that with data structures, we've seen that, um, we see that now with messages. So we've got a reset message and we've got a shutdown message and it's the atom at the beginning is telling us which of those um, is to be dealt with. Now you can see here that we're pattern matching on these messages, we're using a, an atom in the first field and we have a variable in the second. And as you remember from pattern matching with case, typically that variable is not bound, so that will match any value, but it could be bound. Um, so, and we'll talk about that in a few slides time. But, so typically here, what we're, we're doing is receiving a message about some board. If we get the message reset, um, we match the variable board on that, um, on that second field. And then what we do in the body is to send, is to, to invoke the reset function on that particular value. So we've got message passing. We've got uh, this very powerful pattern matching primitive to allow us to choose which message uh, which message to process and to choose to have different processing for different messages. Good. Here's the general pattern. Um, when you execute a receive clause, I think I, I talked through this, all, all this does is show you the general pattern um, that you have a number of, of patterns, uh, a, a number of clauses. Each one begins with, has a pattern as its head and a sequence of expressions as its body. Um, if when you execute a receive, there are no messages in the mailbox, then the, the, the process will suspend until the process receives a, a message. And as I said earlier on, message passing is asynchronous. We don't have in the sender process to have to wait until the message is processed by the recipient. The sender simply sends the message and carries on doing what it wants to do. So what we'll talk about next is, is, is the detail of how this receive statement is executed. So let's have a look at um, this example. We're in pro PID2. And we have a receive statement that has three possibilities. We can receive the atom start. We can receive the atom stop. We can receive a pair whose first element is a PID, match on the variable PID, and whose second at uh, element is the atom foo. Now, what happens when we execute an expression like this? What we do is go to the mailbox and look for the first message that's in the mailbox. If there isn't a message there, we will suspend until a message arrives. But assume there are some messages in there. What do we do? Well, what we do is check for that message whether first it matches the atom start, then we check whether it matches stop, then we check whether it matches it's a pair whose second element is, a, is the atom foo. So we check the clauses in sequence for the first message. If none of those holds, none of those works, we go on and do the same for the second message. And the first message will stay in the mailbox. So this is what is meant by the phrase um, that they are selectively retrieved. So we can check for those, um, the first message for those. If none of it, if, if it matches none of those patterns, we move on to the second. Do the same thing in sequence, checking for a start or a stop or a pair whose second element is foo and so on. So we run through the mailbox until we find a message that succeeds. We process that message by processing the corresponding body and then the receive statement terminates. The messages that we passed over remain in the mailbox. Finally, if none of the messages succeeds, none of the messages successfully pattern matches with any of the, the heads in the receive statement, we simply suspend until more messages come in. But this allows us to choose which messages we want to process at which time. We're not forced, and this is emphatically um, the case, we're not forced to process the messages in the order in which we receive them. 
and that makes for very good modular practice in programming concurrency. So here we see um, an example. If we send the message PID1 foo from PID1 to PID2, if we look at the, um, the reception of that, it won't match a start or a stop but it will match the third clause. And so we'll succeed, we'll process that according to whatever is in the body of that clause and continue. I said I'd come back to this a bit later on. Let's look at that receive statement in PID2. It contains two variables. It contains a variable PID and a variable digit. Both of those begin with capital letters, remember. It's perfectly possible for PID to be bound already. And that means that the effect of this receive statement is only to process messages that come from, come from that one process whose value is in the variable PID. Remember, you can have bound variables in pattern matches. And th this is very unlike traditional pattern matching in other languages, but this is, this is the case in Erlang. So if PID was already bound and perhaps digit wasn't, what this would do is receive messages of that format with any value as the, as the second argument of the, the, the pair, but only with messages from a particular pre process ID. And if that was not the same as PID1, then however many messages we sent from PID1 to PID2, they would never get processed. So we have to be aware that the pattern matching statements may not process all the messages that we receive in a particular process. And so it's possible for mailboxes to grow arbitrarily large if we don't process all potential incoming messages. Now let me just remind you about selective reception. Suppose we are in process PID3 here, and we know that uh, we've got two other processes that are going to send us messages. P PID1 is going to send us a foo, PID2 is going to send us a bar. But we don't know the order in which they're going to arrive. Now, if we had to process messages in the order in which they had, ar had arrived, we would need to have code that would handle the two cases of foo arriving before bar and bar arriving before foo. And you can imagine with, with the more possibilities for, for non-determinism in the order in which mes messages arrive, the more complicated code has to become. What's nice about the Erlang code you see in PID3, it says we choose to process these messages in the order foo first, then bar. And that happens irrespective of the order in which they were sent. As I said, this gives us a lot of power, a lot of control in the way that we deal with um, interaction with concurrent processes, particularly when we have interaction between more than two processes. We're in PID3, we're expecting messages from a number of others. We can't predict the order in which they will come. Even if, and this is a, a, a point I should make now, even if in time we know that the message comes from PID1 before it's, it's sent from PID2, we can't guarantee, there is no guarantee in Erlang that they will be received in that order. For example, PID1 and PID2 might be on different points of a distributed system. There are no guarantees in Erlang that timing between processes, between two separate processes, will be preserved in the order in which they go into the mailbox. However, if we send two messages from the same process, we can guarantee that those will arrive in the mailbox in the same order in which they were sent. So timing between messages from the same processes is preserved, order, or order in time, whereas between messages from different processes, there is no guarantee. Just contrasting the situation we were in um, on the previous slide, if we want to process the messages in the order in which they arrive, 
we don't know whether the first message is the one from PID1, which is a foo, or the one from PID2, which is a bar. So what we have to do is have a receive statement that matches on an arbitrary message and then processes it in an appropriate way. So the variable msg in the receive statement will be bound to foo or bar, depending on which one has arrived first. So that gives us non-selective reception. So we can choose. We want to do if we want to um, choose to process the messages in in the order in which we they've been received. We do a pattern match on the variable msg, and then secondly, what we might do is let's just show it here. We can say receive msg one say, and what we do in there is receive match on msg two. And we can be sure that MSG1 will be the first message to be received and MSG2 will be the second. And then in there, we will have to process those two messages. OK, let's move on. I mentioned earlier on that the way that data gets sent, the way that processed data and process IDs get sent is as part of messages. And we've got an example here of some of... Um, how process IDs can spread through a system of communicating processes. What we do, you can see here, we have a, um, a send in PIDA, a corresponding receive in PIDB, and one in, also in PIDC. So let's see what happens here. First of all, PIDA sends a message to PIDB, and that is a pair, which is a message transfer, and its own PID, self BIF is called, and that has the value, um, let's call it capital A. So in PIDB, we have a receive statement, which is expecting a pair whose first element is a, the transfer atom, whose second element is some variable. And what we do on receiving that is pass it on to PIDC, just pass the same message on. And when we're in PIDC, we're going to receive that. In fact, this time we're matching on the variable PIDA. And what we do then is send, and now we're able from PIDC to send a message to PIDA because we've received its PID indirectly from B and now we can send the message right the way across back to PIDA. So that's how that, so now each of the processes has the PID for process A. A had it through calling self, it sent that on to B, B sent it on to C, and so C could use it to send the message back to A. So that's how uh, information about processes travels through a network. Um, and here's an example of some code now. Let's have a look at this. Um, we've got a module called Echo, and it exports two functions, both of them uh, with no arguments the go function and the loop. The go function is the function that does the, um, does the work. It, the first call is to spawn. It spawns the, um, the process loop in the module echo, which is the process in the loop function in this module with no arguments. And the PID gets stored in the variable PID. So now we have this, uh, another process running the loop code you can see the loop code is on the on the right hand side of the slide what the loop code is going to do is it's going to in a receive loop expect a message from somewhere it's going to get a pair and we're going to interpret the first element of the pair as a PID and what we do is in processing that pair we send a message to the PID which is in the variable from the message we send is whatever from sent to us, paired up with our PID, and then we recursively call loop. Otherwise, if we receive a stop, we simply terminate. And remember, the loop will terminate at that point because we've run out of code. Let's look now at what happens in the Go process. What we've got there is we've sent the message to PID, and now we're going to receive a message. And what are we going to receive? Well, it's going to be a message that says um, it contains a PID and a message. And what we're getting back from that is the message that we sent. 
and what we do is simply print it out. After that receive, we send a final message to, to the loop and what we do is say stop. So that's tidied everything up. That will stop the loop process and it will stop. Um, it will mean that Go will terminate as well. So that gives us an example which pulls together a spawn, which created the, set, the new process, the message passing through PID exclamation, exclamation mark message, and the receive statement where you have a, a number of clauses, each of which has a pattern, which gets matched with the incoming messages, and a corresponding body saying how to process them. So that covers what I wanted to talk about here, creating processes, sending messages, receiving messages, and the sort of data that gets sent. Typically, the message, but also information about PIDs. So in a few, in a, in a few seconds, I'll, I'll move on to concurrent airline 2, but for the moment, what I'd like to do is show you a demonstration. What we're going to do now is take a look at a number of examples of um, small programs that use concurrent processes, message passing between them, to, to get a feel for, what, um, for how it works in practice. Um, our first program is here on the left. We have a module that's called Conk0, and it exports two functions, a start function with no arguments and a main function with one argument. Let's take a look at, first of all, what the start function does. What start does is simply call spawn. And remember, the purpose of spawn is to create a new process. And what the process does is run the function main from whatever module is here. Now, what we've used here is a macro that expands to the name of the current module. So it will run the main function from this module with initial argument 0. And remember, what it does is it will run that until that function terminates. Now let's have a look at what the main function does. It's got an argument t, and its body is a receive statement. With two clauses, first of all, it can map on a uh, match on a PID paired with the atom stop. And remember that we, we process these things sequentially, so only if that doesn't match do we match on a variable there. And what we're assuming here is that what is passed in is an integer. We could, of course, use a guard, a when is integer, to check explicitly it is an integer, but we're just assuming it is for the, the purposes of this example. If we receive a message from call the variable there PID, we're assuming it's going to be a PID. We could also check that as well, in fact. But assuming it's a PID and it's a stop, how do we process that? What we do is send a message back to that PID saying we've stopped, and then we terminate. So indeed, we do stop. However, if what we have is a PID paired with a number, what we do is add that number to the running total t, the thing we passed in, and assign that to next. So the next running total, next value of that is next. We output that value, send that value as a message to PID, and then we go into the loop again, but with a different value. So our running total has changed, and we pass that new value in as the value for the next recursive call. So as this loop gets repeated many times, the value in that variable will change, will increase, and it will contain the running total. And it will carry on until the loop receives a stop message, at which point it will terminate. OK, let's have a look at this in practice now. So let's fire up the shell. Let's compile the program. And then what we're going to do is call the start function. Now, what we can do is to say conk 0 colon start. And we could call that. Now, what that's going to do is return the PID of the process that 
we're launching and we need that PID in order to send a message to it so what we will do is make sure that we capture that return value that value and keep it in the variable PID so now that variable will have the PID of that new process so now we've got another process running and we can send messages to it so um, and what we want to do when we're sending those messages is we're going to need to send our own PID because the shell is itself just another Erlang process. And let's kept, capture that and stick it in the variable self. And we do remember we get that um, value by calling this b the bif self. And you can see you can see the return value of that. It's a process its PID contains the, uh, the number 32, whereas the earlier one contained 39. So now we have, um, we've got our own PID, and we've got the PID of um, the process we spawned. So let's send a message to that PID. And the message we're going to send it is self paired with the number 5. And, but what we get as a result of that is the message that we have sent. And you can see that's, that's a pair. So what we should do now is, because um, what the, the, the main program is going to do on receiving that message is it's going to send a message back to us. So what we need to do is, is to receive that message. And let's just stick it in a variable res1. Um, and you can see that the message we've received was indeed 5. Now let's... Let's go back up here and put in, I don't know, 17, send the message 17. Um, and what we want to do is, again, we want to receive, um, we receive the message, should be getting a message back from the other process. So we could use this. Now, we've already put the first message in the variable res1. So what we're going to do is put the next mes the message we get into the variable res2. And you'll see now that what we've got back is the running total, which is 22. So let's finally send a message to stop. Um, and we do that. We're sending the message, um, again, our own PID, to get paired with the atom stop. Let's send that. That's gone. And then finally, let's see what uh, we get back as a result. We're going to stick the result in, in um, variable res3. And what we get now is that atom stopped. And that has happened because we've processed the, the message using that clause. And that has given us the result. And now the other process will have terminated because the code ends there. So what you can see is that running within the shell, we can use receive. To receive to, to treat uh, messages as they come in we can send messages using uh, the, the primitive message send construct but it's a bit of a mess because we're having to use new variables for each receive clause and so on so what I want to show you next is a way of wrapping these things up in functions to make it much easier to deal with message receive and send Let's take a look at what we can do instead of writing receive and send statements within the shell. Let's see what we could do as an alternative. And what I've got here is, um, is the alternative. We've taken the, the, the program we had before and we've added two new functions. And what these functions do is that they deal with the two cases where we want to send a message to of the form uh, of a number to the other process or a stop message. Let's look at the stop case first. So we're passing in as an argument the process to which we want to send this message and what we do in the body of that function is we send the message which is a stop and then we receive whatever message comes back and return it as an OK. So what we're doing there is we're doing that pair of things, send a message, receive the result. 
as we were doing here. If you look here, on line eight, we sent the message. On line nine, we received the result. And if you look at the, the, the general case, on line four, we sent the message, received the result. On line six, we sent the message and received the result. And you see that pattern encapsulated in the add function. So add takes two arguments, a PID and a number. And we're assigning, in this case, we're assigning uh, the value of self to the variable self. We don't have to do that. Um, and then we send a message to that PID with our PID and the number. And then we receive whatever result is sent back. So this encapsulates precisely what we were doing on lines four and five and on lines six and seven in that example. So let's take a look at this in action. We'll start the Erlang shell. We'll compile conk1. And what we'll do here is, first of all, um, we launch that new process. So PID equals conk1 colon start. We get that PID back. And now instead of what we did on lines four and five here, sending a um, message, receiving the result, we'll call the function add with the PID and the value five. And you see what we get back is the value five. Now because this is in a, this receive is in a, inside a function, this will get, um, each time we call the function, we get a new variable res, so we're not in the situation of having to have a different variable for it to handle each message. So that did that covers what we did on lines four and five. If we replace that five by a, oops, by a um, 17, we should do, get the effect of what we did on lines six and seven. And indeed, we're getting back the result there, 22. And then finally, we can call conk1 stop the PID. And what we should get is the effect of lines 8 and 9. And indeed, what we're getting is a result OK, um, because what we're doing inside the stop function is saying whatever message we receive, we're going to return the result OK. Um, but of course, that is going to have stopped the other process, because it's run out of code. So there we're seeing precisely how um, these functional, writing these functions on top of the send and receive pattern allow us to, um, to interact with, our other, with this other process in a much cleaner way than, um, than doing it using bear, receive and send. Okay, so I think at that point... Um, I'm going to stop the demonstrations. We've had a, we've seen how to to launch a new function, a new process that's using spawn, message passing to the pro, to a process using an exclamation mark, message receive using a, a receive statement potentially with multiple clauses. You can do pattern matching, and we've seen how, in order to facilitate communication, we send. PIDs as parts of messages. So in this add function, we send our own PID as the first half of the message so that inside the other process, we can use that PID to send them a message back to us. Okay, so what we'll do is now we'll go back to looking at some more examples and developing the, the, the theory of, of concurrency rather more. Okay.